Hi folks, this is Dr. Rob Sivis. I am the Carb Addiction Doc. And today we're going to discuss the carnivore diet. And not the whole thing, but just some very specific elements about us. Uh, by the way, if there's value, if you find value in this discussion, please hit the subscribe button on this YouTube channel, Carb Addiction Doc. And if you really find tremendous value and you want to keep supporting these uh, videos, buy us a cup of coffee at our Patreon account at Carb Addiction Doc. It helps to keep these videos free. Now, in order to begin to discuss the carnivore diet, it is a very wide range. I'm going to highlight a few focuses, but I'm going to give a shout out to somebody. I've just received an advanced copy of this book. Uh, it's by a woman by the name of Judy Cho. Um, and uh, I believe she's a nurse, but she and I have had plenty of interactions. I highly support what she does from a dietary perspective. Her uh, latest book is The Carnival Cure. It is an excellent read. It is very biological and scientific. It covers a variety of different things. Like a lot of things, most of it I agree with, some of the things I disagree with, uh, particularly the addiction side. But um, I really, really, if anybody's interested in a carnivore book, uh, this is an excellent, excellent uh, way of life, a book to read and maybe metabolize uh, prior to going pure carnivore. Um, so in my case, I am mostly carnivore. And the first why, not because it's better or it's healthier or there's any greater benefit for me. I've just not had any major illnesses other than obesity, which came directly from chronic excessive carbohydrate consumption. So for someone like myself, and I, I'm included, include a number of people out there who really haven't suffered major metabolic diseases because of this or have intolerances to certain foods, I'm mostly carnivore because it suits my lifestyle better. I first went low carb, then started adding the fat, and then slowly migrated toward eating more and more carnivorous diet because I like the food, number one. Number two is it's really easy for me to cook this way. And Almost always, after a carnival meal, I have leftovers, and I'm absolutely fine eating leftovers for a couple of nights. So about every third or fourth night, we have leftover night. And it might be some salmon, some beef, some sardines, chicken, turkey now, obviously. Um, but the other cool part is that, at worst with leftovers, my dog will eat anything that I throw at him when it comes to carnival food. Eh, he's not so keen on salad and lettuce. So I just hated throwing away a bunch of vegetables at the end of the week that had gone off, gone rotten. I realized I didn't need them. So I migrated toward carnivore as a stepwise directional thing. I didn't go from the standard American diet to pure carnivore. I would have crashed and burned. It doesn't work that way. Your body is not tolerant to it if you go straight from standard American diet to carnivore. So if you're going to do that, do it progressively over the course of a few weeks. Because this is not a diet, carnivore is not a diet you do for eight weeks to get to, to lose some weight. It is not a diet. It has to become a way of life. And for those authoritarian people, are, I'm strict carnivore, I don't eat pepper, I don't eat God. Come on, guys, get a grip. This isn't about perfectionism. In fact, perfectionism is the enemy of good enough. So if I go out to a restaurant and they're serving a salad or some asparagus, I'm going to eat it. I'm not going to eat carbohydrates. But at home, we only have carnival food. And yes, dairy is included in that because I don't have an issue with dairy. And dairy is a valuable, valuable asset to my carnival diet. If dairy doesn't agree with you, don't eat it. That's logic. But don't use science to demonize dairy. Because that science doesn't exist, folks. My son, who's now four months old, is on pure carnivore dairy. That's all he's eating. And in fact, the cows that all of you love to eat live on milk, on their mother's milk, until they're more than half the size of an adult. That has huge value. And my wife drinks a glass of milk with cream in it every day. So don't demonize dairy. If it doesn't agree with you, obviously, logically, stay away from it. But don't demonize it based on science, because the science is just not there. And the value of dairy, in terms of micronutrients, of protein, and of healthy fat, is enormous. 
Okay, same thing with eggs. If you're allergic to them, stay away from them. But eggs are an excellent source of everything. Think about an egg. An egg is a pre-chicken. If you don't interrupt that process, that egg will probably become a chicken, especially if it's if it's uh, free range and there's maybe a few males in the in the in the cycle. <laughs> However, um, eggs are chicken precursors, so they have everything required to form a chicken. All the micronutrients are there, all the proteins, all the fats, all the cholesterol that your body needs is in an egg. So eggs are excellent. Again, don't demonize them. If you've got an allergy to egg protein, that's fine. But eggs are a value, value, very valuable resource of micronutrients on a carnivore diet. And the other factor, just while we're talking about carnivore, always try to, inc uh, to include fat as part of your uh, animal experience. Fat is the chemical that, human bodies, that the human body uses by triggering a series of hormones in our intestine and in our fat cells that trigger satiety. So you never have to predetermine how much you're going to eat. Have a pile of meat in front of you and eat, and as soon as you, not are stuffed, but as soon as you begin to feel full, it's a different feeling. Fat satiety is a chemical feeling rather than a gastric distension feeling. Oh, I'm stuffed, I'm full. That, that we use for carbohydrates, but you don't need to use that for carnivore. Use fat, and as soon as you begin to feel a little queasy, a little chemically full, stop. You'll be absolutely fine. Unless you look like an Olsen twin, you don't have to overeat. And that's one of the benefits of a carnivore diet when we're dealing with obesity. But even for those of you that are not obese, you don't have to overeat. Bang for buck, there's plenty of calories. And the whole concept of 2,000 calories a day is absolute bullshit. Because your body doesn't work that way. On a carnivore diet, you can get by with anywhere from 500 to 800 calories a day and be as healthy as you are on a 2,000 plus calorie a diet day on, on uh, carbohydrates. And remember, fat has a huge caloric bang for buck. So don't listen to the dietitians that tell you how many calories you have to eat. It is inconsequential because calories are not the same and they're handled differently by your body. Eat you full and you're going to be fine. Allow fat to be that satiety measure. Now, the next thing about carnivore is try to eat a range of products. One of the problems with a lot of Americans is we tend to eat the muscles of animals. We eat the chicken breast, we eat the large fish, the tuna or the salmon, the flesh of that, that animal, and we tend to eat the beef, the pork, the, uh, the bacon or the, the pork chop or the steak uh, or the ground beef. We tend to eat the muscles of animals. And while from a macronutrient perspective, protein and fat, excellent. But there is a micronutrient deficiency that occurs slowly, insidiously over time when you only eat the muscles of animals. It is critically important that you also focus on a carnivore diet on two additional things. Number one, eating whole animals. And number two is eating some organs. You don't have to go totally nose to tail. You don't have to go nose to tail, but at least consider eating things beyond the muscles of the animals. Now, what sources? That's why I focus on dairy. That's why I focus on eggs. An egg is a whole animal. It's a whole chicken. But also some of the smaller fish, if you can, the sardines, the, the white anchovies, the herring, that type of food, where it includes the whole animals, skeleton, skin, everything else, which is so many healthy macronutrients, particularly in those smaller fishes, with a much lower mercury load. And the same thing when it comes to shellfish oysters, shrimp, that type of food, have, especially if you eat most of the whole animal, oysters and mussels, that's an excellent source of complete nutrition. And then the final part, particularly when it comes to the three and the six omega fatty acids, is eating fish roe, fish eggs, caviar, <laughs> yeah, if you can afford that, but, but eating fish eggs from time to time. So I will eat Japanese food on a fairly regular basis, it's usually sashimi, but I'll always get the fish roll with that. So there are a variety of ways to make sure you get adequate supplementation of your micronutrients on a carnivore diet. It is an extremely healthy diet. Your intestine and your body will love you for it because the human body is primarily driven by enzymatic nutrition breakdown in the small intestine. The colon is really not involved uh, in nutrition in humans, except for salt and water. And the stomach is really not involved 
like it is in cows in human nutrition. It's the small intestine. And that's why the carnivore diet is of so much value. However, folks, um, the, there are two significant deficiencies that do occur on even a well-balanced health, and I hate that word balance, but a diverse carnivore diet. And the first one, the first deficiency, is vitamin C. Vitamin C is the single nutrient most often cited by the plant-based people to prove that we must eat plant foods and carbohydrates. And here are the responses to that. Number one, animal foods do contain vitamin C. But that's usually something like chicken liver or liver, which has a huge amount of, of vitamin C. And if you don't eat liver on a regular basis, by the way, uh, the liver is the, probably the single most important organ if you can eat it, if you can tolerate it. And, and sometimes it may be necessary to camouflage your liver. For my kids, for example, I will take uh, chicken livers and chop them up and put them in the hamburgers that I make at home. You camouflage it that way, and they don't even know they're eating liver. But liver is a healthy source of vitamin C. If you can't tolerate liver, don't eat it, but find ways to get in those nutrients. So the first thing is, yeah, uh, animal foods do contain some vitamin C. And the second thing is that a standard American diet, particularly a high-carbohydrate diet, has a much, much higher requirement for vitamin C than you need on a carnivore diet because it's involved in food metabolism, but not so much in carnivore metabolism. However, vitamin C is essential. And here's the other thing about vitamin C, folks. The human body does not store vitamin C. It gets depleted very, very quickly. So it's something you have to eat on a regular basis. If you're doing liver two or three times a week, eating some small fish two or three times a week, you may have enough. But I think it is very, very important that when you're on an all-meat diet, vitamin C absorption is more efficient and your body's requirement for it does go down. And you can get sufficient amounts from the food, from the meat you eat. And you won't get scurvy, but it is still important to make sure that you're getting a decent amount of vitamin C. And, and for me, one of the key components of a diet is to not have to supplement pills for what we should get from our food. So yeah, you could take vitamin C in a pill form. But here is a, is a, little, a, a little hack. And you've got to get outside of your perfectionistic carnivore diet mentality. But if you drink water, even one glass a day, and you take some lime or you take some lemon and you squeeze a wedge of lime or a wedge of lemon into your glass of water and you drink that, you're getting all the vitamins you need per day. And if you do that every day, once or twice with a couple of glasses of water, you're going to be absolutely fine. In fact, in our garden, we have a couple of, we live in Florida, a couple of key lime trees. And the key lime, I love their juice. The key lime juice is very rich, small amount. We squeeze that into our water and then we can forget about, forget about it. Here's my New York <laughs> accent from Africa. Uh, forget about vitamin C of being an issue. Now, so, but, but, but focus on foods or, or ways to get vitamin C in. The second thing, and, and if you squeeze half a lime or, or a wedge of lemon into your water, you're not killing yourself with carbohydrates. The second micronutrient that is missing quite often in a, uh, um, a pure carnivore diet is a rare mineral called manganese, something we don't often talk about, MN, manganese. And, and certainly liver and sardines will provide that. Clams, oysters, mussels will do that. But manganese deficiency is very difficult to pick up. And, and manganese deficiency, particularly for people who are healthy doing a carnivore diet, that's fine. But for example, people who are type 2 diabetics who are using a carnivore diet to correct themselves, and I'd strongly advocate for that. While they're still becoming fat adapted and adapted to the carnivore diet, manganese is an important cofactor co for several enzymes. It's involved in glucose, carbohydrate, and lipid metabolism. And if you do not have adequate levels of manganese, even though the levels can be very, very small, you can suffer from adequate micronutrient metabolism. And that deficiency may alter carbohydrate metabolism and cause certain abnormalities in glucose tolerance and maintain insulin resistance. So manganese is something that you want 
to make sure you're supplementing preferentially in food. And where does manganese come from? Well, here's the interesting part. I'm going to read this off a little table. And we're going to, we're going to do this particularly from a carnivore source. So the best places for manganese in food is mussels, oysters, clams, some of the meats, and certainly liver. Eggs have a little bit. But here's also where there is a slight variant to moving slightly off carnivore, calling it dirty carnivore. And these are things to consider if you're not absolutist and perfectionistic about your carnivore diet. Hazelnuts, pecans, tea, black tea, sesame seeds, black pepper, all have reasonable amounts of manganese in them. And if you add those to your food from time to time, or you have some nuts with your meals, that is not a bad way to get adequate stores of manganese in. However, there is zero manganese in coffee, shrimp, tuna, chicken, uh, beef, ground beef, eggs have very, very low amounts of manganese, which is interesting. Milk has very low levels. So please be careful when you go pure carnivore, especially early on when your body may have a higher need of supplementing vitamin C and supp supplementing manganese. Because manganese is important for bones, for reproduction, for blood calling, for the immune system, as well as uh, carbohydrate and other macronutrient metabolism. So a broad spectrum carnivore, carnivore diet is an incredibly healthy diet. Not only in terms of what you are getting in, but also about certain things that may be causing damage that you're not getting in, plant-based damage. And over time, your uh, um, bacterial and fungal and viral biome converts to a very healthy one, which is a non-fermenter uh, biome, which is associated with the carnivore diet. However, make sure that you do supplement vitamin C and manganese if you can. Good luck. Take care. Remember, perfection is the enemy of good enough. Perfection is the enemy of good enough. You won't die if you eat a hazelnut, unless you're allergic. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram. We put little posts out there. Thanks so much. Leave a comment.